Dr. Spencer, can you give us an update on new developments that you think have the promise of changing epilepsy surgery? So I think this is quite an exciting uh, time, you know, in the field of, of epilepsy because if you look at the premise of surgery, uh, it's based on historically areas of the brain that can be resected to help control seizures without causing neurological cognitive side effects. And that's been the uniform goal for years and, and years. Um, but our, our tools and our approach, our approaches have been, you know, very much the same for a long time. What, is, what has changed, as in any field, is often the technology. So the technology of imaging and the technology of, uh, of operating suites and what's available in those have changed. But at the present time, we really are understanding much more about the brain, which is, in essence, going to change our surgical approaches. And by that, I mean, I think at this, um, at this time, both at the AES meeting and before, and, and I'm sure subsequently, uh, both our researchers and clinicians are thinking of the brain more in, as a network. And we know that the brain is functionally a network and normally interacts and, and that's the way our brain works. But to begin to conceive of epilepsy uh, as a disruption of normal functional networks or epilepsy as usurping you know, normal networks in causing disease along those networks and not necessarily completely focally uh, is a new concept over the past uh, period of time. And that, has, that came to sort of fruition, I think, during, you know, during this uh, AES meeting. And at the same time that everybody begins to look at epilepsy in terms of network dysfunction, the surgical changes, the surgical tools are right now beginning to change too. So for instance, if you believe that you must look at epilepsy in a network form, then it has to result in a more distributed, more distributed uh, causality. And if you're going to try to understand that distribution, then do you have biomarkers? Do you have non-invasive biomarkers to tell you where the, the diseases are? Uh, that you may be able to deal with surgically. And although we are continuing to grow imaging and other non-invasive biomarkers, you know, they're not quite, they're not there. So our gold standard for being able to localize, which is what surgeons need, what is the most epileptogenic region of the brain uh, and its relationship to, to the network, uh, the gold standard remains intracranial electrode studies. And so we have seen most recently in the past year or so in an acceleration, uh, a variety of you know, not new, but flexible, uh, the flexibility of monitoring intracranially. So there's now stereo EEG, which is mostly the use of depth electrodes. There are uh, the grids and strips that have traditionally been used. And I think many are using combinations of these to try to get at that network distribution of epileptogenesis. So studying and understanding where focality is, is one component. Uh, and the electrophysiology is changing, as I said, to, to meet that. And then once you begin to understand that you may need to deal with this network, what do we have to help us in our in our toolbox? Um, and one of those, obviously, is neuromodulation. So now, um, with FDA approval of uh, uh, neurostimulation, focal neurostimulation, and hopefully future approval of more central stimulation for other network uh, focalities in, in epilepsy, then uh, we have a new a new group of tools and a new range of patients that, that may be treated that are now not able to be treated. So stimulation is, you know, an important part of now going forward understanding 
um, how we can help help patients. That very stimulation parameter also is going to allow us uh, to learn more about the patients because we'll have electrodes intracranially for long periods of time and we're going to understand much more about their epilepsy and their specific characterizations. Uh, and then there is, um, uh, right now at the AES meeting, uh, there was a, a large number of both posters and talks on laser ablation. Mm -hmm. And laser ablation, although it sounds as though well, you're trying to move back into identifying a single focus and ablating that, uh, in fact, I think most individuals who are using laser ablation understand uh, that <clears throat> they may be ablating a node in a pathway of epileptogenesis, but that if one can do that perhaps less invasively, uh, and if one can do that with some control of the patient's uh, seizures, uh, that would, um, we don't know if it's going to approach open surgery, but it is, um, it is less invasive, so it allows the patient right now to at least um, have the opportunity to undergo possible control and over time they haven't necessarily lost the ability to have open surgery. So I think that we don't know what the long-term outcomes are going to be, but it is certainly worthwhile to have that in our toolbox. It's another flexible tool and it, it addresses another important issue, which is uh, the importance of outcomes, of cognitive neurological outcomes. Can we do things to the network that will alter the pathology of the network and not uh, cause cognitive or neurological problems. So that perhaps is going to be one advantage. We we just need to follow this, you know, down the road and, and see where it's see where it's going to, to lead us. Um, and I think that's the those are the major the major issues: changes in intracranial studies, changer changes in focal surgical approaches, mm -hmm. uh, changes by neuromodulation, both local and central. Uh, and there are posters uh, at this recent uh, meeting uh, that have, you know, beginning to demonstrate central network stimulation that are going to affect broad areas of the, of the brain. Um, we just mustn't forget that the most important issue is to look at our patients' outcomes, mm -hmm. look at side effects, and make sure that we are um, doing the best for them and providing the best care. Do you think there's anything uh, clinicians should be doing uh, to increase the likelihood of successful surgery in their patients, in either identifying patients? Yeah, well, I think this is, a, uh, and I'm glad you brought that up because it's a very, you know, old problem, and that is <clears throat> we know that if we have access to trying to change a patient's uh, focal epileptology, it should be done at a young age. So we need to get to the patients and, and evaluate them much earlier. That means referrals from the community, neurologists and internists, to centers of excellence in uh, epilepsy and epilepsy surgery mm -hmm. so that patients can be evaluated. Uh, um, you know, not all of these patients may be surgical candidates, but the ones that are Right now, the average age for somebody re, you know, referred for surgery is in their late 20s, and that's no different than it was 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's wrong. Uh, we, we should at least be evaluating these patients because if you're going to change the important issues, and that is quality of life in a patient, if you're going to help their social, social standing, if you're going to allow them to complete their education, if you want them to either go back to work or have the ability to start work, then obviously that has to be done when they're young enough to have their life ahead of them. You know, it's dem been demonstrated over and over. Once uh, we get, you know, into an older population, there's no difference in our being able to control their seizures, but there may be a big difference in their, be their ability to uh, rehabilitate and to resume a better lifestyle. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Spencer. Okay.